Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you all for, for coming out on this wild and windy afternoon. Um, John, real, always a pleasure to talk to you. Always uh, a pleasure to be talked to. <laughs> but a particular pleasure to be here with you in this wonderful, magical corner of, of Wexford. What, what does Wexford mean to you, John? Well, I got quite nostalgic coming down today because I came on the train, and I do think that the train from... Dublin to Wexford is one of the most beautiful train journeys in the world, certainly one of the most beautiful I've been on, especially that bit from Inniscorthy down to Wexford where the, the estuary widens out and the swans are there and the egrets and so on, they're really beautiful. Um, <coughs> Wexford to me is, I mean the Wexford that I grew up in is, is gone. Uh, it exists in my imagination. I have a, a friend, a Dubliner, and every time I publish his book he says, I suppose you've gone back to Wexford, have you? And I said, no, 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 no. I said, oh, well, yeah, I have. It is, I suppose, a place in my imagination. And, you know, for every artist, childhood is immensely important. Baudelaire said that genius, genius of small g, uh, consists in the ability to summon up childhood at will. Mm. And uh, so childhood and the place where I was a child is immensely important to me. But also there's... <laughs> I was born on the 8th of December, uh, which used to be a public holiday. Um, and I used to be brought to Dublin every, uh, for a birthday treat. But on the way, there was a particular house. That the train used to slow down somewhere outside Gorey or Arkler or somewhere. There was a house I used to look at. And I used to wonder about the lives lived there. And on the train coming down today, I, was, I realized there was a woman sitting opposite me. And I could see her thinking, what, why is, what is he looking for? Because I was just trained on the window to see if I could find that house. I didn't. <laughs> you know, I was uh, thinking about coming down here with you today. I suppose I was trying to imagine or visualize the little boy, John Banville. What was he like? Could you describe him to me? Oh, a horrible little twerp. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I mean there. that. I mean, I really, I, I, my poor sister is here, and she had to put up with me. Uh, and she was very, she was very forbearing, um, and so was my my late brother. Uh, no, I was a horrible little creature. Um, Why do you say that? Well, I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to be in Wexford. I didn't want to be in Ireland. I wanted to be in some magical uh, place in the middle of Europe. Um, this, I mean, this is all, you know, fantasies of a little boy in Wexford. Um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't look at Wexford when I was here. I always tell the story that I had a, I had a very sophisticated friend. He seemed to be very sophisticated. When I was about 13, 14, he was 16, 17. And I remember sitting in, with him in the old White's Hotel and the, having a coffee, this is the height of sophistication in those days, to have a coffee in White's Hotel. And he was telling me about wife swapping in Wexford. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, there's a party, you know, and people go in, they throw their car keys into a bowl, and, and then they all go off with them. And of course, the first thing I said was, but what if you got your own wife's <laughs> keys? Uh, and I didn't believe this at all, but of course, I'm sure he was right. I'm sure such things did go on. Uh, and I just, the point I'm making is that I ignored the place that I was in uh, in order to be elsewhere. Mm. Life for me was always elsewhere. And this was a great mistake on my part, a great loss. Uh, I missed what was in front of what was under my nose, what was before me. Mm. I was going to ask you all about the wife swapping, but we'll leave that to later. Um, so John, they're, they're too young to remember. Who, who knows? Um, you know, John, as a little boy carrying these dreams of elsewhere, where did those visions come from? How did you know about elsewhere? The Wexford Public Library. Uh, that was my, uh, my bolt hole. It was my place to escape. But 
I rapidly discovered that reading was not an escape from life, it was an escape into life. I always tried to make this distinction. I listened to Radio 3, BBC Radio 3, which is a wonderful classical music station and great treasure. But they're constantly saying, escape with us, escape with us. The point of art is not escape. The point of art is to be vividly alive. And in the, the Maxwell Public Library, I discovered the world. Uh, and you know, people say, oh, just books. Books are just, books are, they open into the world, uh, as all art does. The artwork, it's in a book, it's in a book of poetry, it's in a painting, it's in a piece of music, but it's a gateway to the world. Um, this is something that we, sorry, I'll get off my high horse. Um, this is something we're, we're losing sight of. We're, we're beginning to think of art in, in our time as escapism. Mm. And I know the world is a horrible place, but escaping from it is the last thing we should be doing. That's a long and ridiculous answer to a simple question. But anyway, the Wexford Public Library mm. was my, my place. And, um, you know, was there one book that you remember kind of opened a door for you that you went, ha? Huh. Well, my sister gave me a copy of Dubliners when I was, I don't know what age I was, quite young. And that was the great discovery for me because um, I discovered that literature, art, could be about life as I knew it. It didn't have to be detective stories or Wild West yarns or fantasies about public school boys in, in Greyfriars and places. That, this, that, that writing could be about life. Now, Joyce was writing in the Edwardian era, but I grew up in the 1950s. It wasn't all that long after that. But Joyce's the Dubliners, I've been re reading it again recently, and um, it's timeless, uh, and it is, about, it is about life as it's lived. This was, as I say, a great revelation to me. I'm still not sure that I write about life as it's lived. Um, I tend not to be very interested in people. You know, people constantly tell me I'm not interested in them. Um, I think that art has to strike beyond the mere doings of the day to something essential. I always say I'm not interested in what people do, I'm interested in what people are. And before we come to that, a last question we about... We have come to that. We have indeed. <laughs> Slow down. Um, did you come from a literary household? Was, was Not that... at all, no, no. No, my father read, I think, Wild West stories, and my mother read the Irish Catholic, but she also read Woman and Woman's Own. I went to confession one day and having no sins to confess, told the bloody priest that she read Woman and Woman's Own, and he told her she'd have to give it up. <laughs> and she did. One of the, one, it's a smaller thing to hold against the church, but it's one of the things that I hold bitterly against. This, this, no, this is not funny. This is not funny. This was a splash, these two little magazines were splashes of color in a gray uh, world, the gray world of the 1950s, early 60s. And this damn priest took that away from her. Um, you know, as I know that the church has <laughs> committed many more egregious sins than that, but that was the first one I held against it. Mm. You know, you were mentioning earlier that you know, your Wexford is a, a remembered and imagined Wexford. Um, there is that sense throughout your books, you know, you mentioned about not really writing about life as it is. There is a sense throughout your books of, of you conjuring up a place that is at one remove from what we consider reality. Is that fair? But that's where we live. You know, we don't live in this everyday grey world talking about the weather. That's, that's the surface of it. We live much more deeply than that. And the real artists, the the Beckett's, the, the Rilke's, the Velasquez's, the, 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 the late Beethoven, they're the people who are striking beyond the mere dailiness of life to get at the essentials. That seems to me the job of the artist, uh, the task of the artist, the duty of the artist. I mean, this is not a popular position to take, but it's the only one I can take because that's how I think art should be. 
That's what the artist should do, and I think it's what art should aim for. So for you, there is sometimes in your books that feeling of being in a parallel universe. A, a, you know, when did you first find your way to that as a novelist? Oh, I mean, as a human being, as a child, I was absolutely fascinated and amazed and bewildered by the world. Um, and I still am. I mean, one doesn't grow up. There's a certain, a certain something in oneself that never grows up. I still look at the world in a state of astonishment. Um, you know, in Ireland we're constantly complaining about rain. But rain is the most extraordinary phenomenon. You're walking on the street and suddenly water is falling on you out of the sky. It's only because we got used to these things that we think that they're, they're ordinary and banal. They're not. I mean, these are all absolutely extraordinary things. This, this world, I mean, I've, I've said this many times in public before. You get to my age, you've said everything in public at least five times. <laughs> but uh, in the only time I've spoken directly in any of my books is a little passage in the Book of Evidence where the the main character says, I've never got used to being on this earth. I think our presence here is a cosmic blunder. I think we're meant for somewhere else. And then he speculates on how the people who are meant for here would be getting on and their planet on the other side of the galaxy. And he says, no, no, no. They would have become extinct long ago because how would they survive gentle earthlings in a place made to contain us? And I think that's true. I think that we are... Uh, a very strange presence here. I mean, we're the, we're the most successful virus this poor planet has ever known. And it's struggling to get rid of us. I often say I had great hopes for COVID, but uh, it let me down. <laughs> but uh, to, no, I mean, to answer your question, this, if you were to ask me, why I, I, I'm an artist, why I make art, and I insist that the novel is an art form in certain of its manifestations. Um, it's this amazement in face of the world. Uh, you know, I, I got out of the car here, you see, I, I left Dublin today in sunshine, uh, got on the train, a beautiful trip down, arrived, met at the station, Brought to Kilmore, get out of the car, Kilmore. There's practically a storm blowing, and the clouds are whizzing across the sky. This is an extraordinary thing. Clouds, I, oh, I, I know I go on about it always, but clouds fascinate me. You know, you're sitting there, and there's a blue sky, and then suddenly all this cannon smoke comes up. And cannon smoke is good because, you know, those clouds, one of those big clouds contains as much energy as a hydrogen bomb. They're extraordinary things. And they just drift over us. I remember meeting a Spanish diplomat who had been stationed here. And he said, he said, I was there for three years. Didn't go to the theater. Didn't go to, I, just, I just sit in the window and watch the sky. <laughs> yeah. So that, that bafflement and that astonishment in face of the world is why I make art to try to give an account of it to myself. And, you know, if now and then other people share that dream, that, 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 that exploratory dream, mm. which I think fiction is, that's a good exploratory dream. Let's remember that one. Um, John, if we are this, this race kind of adrift, really, in the, in the universe, um, there are many references in your books to, or addressed to little God or gods, all with a, a small g. Do you have any faith in the gods? What do the gods mean to you? Oh, well, I think that the, the, great, the greatest disaster for Western civilization was the Emperor Constantine, who uh, made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And we had, uh, we had one God, that vengeful guy up there who's saying, if you don't love me enough, and if you don't 
adore me, I will send you to everlasting flames. How did we ever invent this madman in the sky? How did we ever fall for it? You know, of course he had his loyal ministers and uh, his, his, his women who would do it for him. God knows we know about it in this country. But how did we ever fall for it? Mm. Whereas in pagan times, there was a God for everything. If you're walking on the street and you trip, fall off the pavement, oh, I know who did that. Such and such a God, this God. That's a sensible way to do it. And the gods were just one step above us. They were as bad as us, they were as greedy as us, as lustful as us, as violent as us, as, just as awful as us. But they were up there, slightly above us. That's a perfect religion to have. I mean, why, why invent this madman in the sky? Mm. It was St. Paul. <laughs> That's another one of my, my, my bit. Bar. Nietzsche, said, Nietzsche said, he said, there was only one Christian and he died on the cross. And then St. Paul came along and thought, here is power. St. Paul, the closet homosexual, hating himself, hating women, said, here's, a way, here's something I can do. And he said to me, remember when he says in one of those letters, he said, if Christ be not risen, we are lost. In other words, saying, all you guys have to believe this, that this guy got, this poor evangelist, this poor man who wanted to help the, the weak, and, yeah, and the Romans uh, uh, crucified him, he said, you have to believe that he didn't die. He's going to come back. This, this mad notion. So, anyway, I'm having a great time. <laughs> Ske skewering all my, my, my enemies. Ask me another question. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, Alan, am I, am I giving you a hard time? I hope no. no. I hope I'm, not. I'm enjoying it. Good, good, good. Uh, this, this Christian God mythology, were you ever in love with it, even when you were younger? I was terrified by it, which is what the church did. I mean, look, you're a seven-year-old child, and you start learning the catechism, and it tells you, you know, who made the world? God made the world. Why did God make the world? Made man's use and benefit, which we're suffering from now. I mean, let's not fool ourselves. Western civilization is a Christian civilization, even if we don't go to church anymore, and we don't, you know, uh, uh, we deny God. It's still a okay. Everything, that, every institution we have is based on Christian principles. Uh, as time we got rid of it. But uh, I did, of course, I was terrified. But what really terrified me when I was a little boy was heaven. Hell I could cope with. But heaven, there was going to be an eternity of awful people <laughs> being really nice. <laughs> you know? Everybody going around saying, Oh, John, hello. I was that bully that beat you up day after day in the school year. But now I'm nice, and look at my nice white gown. Let's go, you know, let's be nice to each other. That really terrified me. That was a hard, I mean, it, that would keep me awake at night as a little boy, seven, eight, nine year old, worrying about eternity. And of course, I'm still obsessed with eternity. But eternity now is a different thing. I discovered science, <laughs> which is its own kind of religion. You know? Yeah, we'll come to that. Just a last thing about the the big God in the sky, you're implicit in that theology is, as you say, guilt. And, and yet guilt pervades your books, this sense of oh, yeah. secrets, guilt. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I should say that I'm immensely grateful to my Catholic upbringing because, yeah, as W.H. Orton said, children should be loaded with as much trauma as they can bear. It'll be good for them. It'll be good for them. And that was good for me. Uh, guilt is a, a, one of the precious gifts that the church gave to me, the sense of guilt, the sense of being uh, that there is, there is somebody watching me. There's somebody saying, you know, you, you, you're doing it all wrong. Uh, and that, you know, as an artist, that's very good because art is constantly aspiring towards perfection, aspiring towards, as you would say, the big God in the sky, and failing. Uh, so it's good to have uh, the, the notion that, that, I mean, you know, I, there are writers, I think, who like their own work. I find this very strange, very, very strange. I can't imagine. I mean, I, if I even catch sight of 
a sentence or a passage from my book, I, I just feel embarrassed. Mm. I want to turn away because mm. this, this is this awful mistake I made. Mm. You know, I've been making mistakes, you know, for <laughs> 60, 65 years. Uh, it's the time I stopped. But that the church did give me that. Christianity did give me that drive to to perfect, to 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 redeem myself mm. by good works. You know, um, I mean, I don't believe it for a moment, but it's a good it's a good working method. Mm. Mm. But that's that that sense of guilt of something hidden seems to be very strong beyond just being critical of your own work. It seems very strong in your books. Well, Do you feel that strongly? I've committed many sins in my life. Uh, I've lied to people. I've hurt people. I've damaged people. Of course I have. I presume we all have. Uh, there may be saints among us, but uh, I don't know them. Um, so yes, I mean, guilt and the sense of inadequacy seems to be the human condition. Um, I wouldn't want it otherwise. Mm. I, I remember saying to my mother one day, <laughs> maybe my sister would remember this, she, she was talking, she was saying, you know, her, her life hadn't gone the way she wanted to go. And I said, well, you know, you, you three children, and you, you, you made happy lives, and you said, ah, happiness. And I know exactly what she meant. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be happy. Imagine being happy all the time. Mm. Be like being in heaven. <laughs> uh, well, no, no. Happiness comes in little bursts yeah. every now and then. You know, you look at the clouds or you look at your, your daughter or your loved one or just, you know, a piece of cake. Mm. Happiness comes in these little bursts and it keeps us going. It's, it's, I, I remember the first time I saw, you know, those baths that they have now which spurts water out. What do you, what do you call them? Um, Jacuzzi. Jacuzzis. First time I saw it, I said, that's like life. Little spurts come out every now and then. And you're lying there in tepid water and something, you know, something gives you a jolt. That's life. Mm. <laughs> life is a jacuzzi. This is, this is all you good. remember from this, this occasion. Is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life is a jacuzzi. One of the greater pearls of wisdom that you take away from this day. And John, then just to finish that thought, is, is there something in writing that is about looking for forgiveness, looking for... No, it's looking for, as I say, for perfection. Look, I, I write, I think, in order to try to account for the world to myself. As I said at the beginning, that my bewilderment in the face of the world, this exquisite world, and this horrendous world. Um, you know, Germany produced Beethoven, Austria just down the road produced Hitler. Very, very strange, very strange world. Um, and to, to try to give an account of that to myself is why I, why I make art. Um, but art is very strange because it's not like life at all. I mean, the novel is supposed to be the most realistic form of all. It's not. A novel is nothing like life. A novel has a beginning and an end. We don't remember our birth, and as Wittgenstein says, but death is not an experience in life. All we have is the messy bit in the middle. So we go to art, but that sense of, as the critic Frank Kermode said, the sense of an ending, the sense of something being finished, something being shaped. Uh, and yet, art, in some way, seems to us a parallel world to ours. Uh, it's very mysterious. I don't understand it, and I don't expect ever to understand it. I, years ago, I got my Spanish publishers to, to get me into the Prado to see Velázquez's Las Meninas, which I think is one of the great artworks of, of Western civilization. And I was there on my own with it, and it was an extremely uncomfortable experience. Because the work of art, when you face it without distractions, without other people around, it's, it looks back at you. This is one of the powerful things about the work of art. 
it interrogates you. You think you're interrogating it, but the work about it interrogates you. Um, and that's one of the that's one of the reasons we we you know the work about the real work about never wears out. It maintains its mystery, and it maintains its sense of interrogation and sense of questioning. The sense of you are not going to know me. You are not going to absorb me. You can absorb a, 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 a pop song or a, a, you know a, the stuff in, in popular culture. Real works of art cannot be absorbed. They maintain their distance. That's the power that they have. They just stand there. Um, you know, you know uh, it always fascinates me. <laughs> they even read a novel and they say, oh, I read that. You haven't read a novel when you read it once. If a novel is any good, you have to read it at least three times. Mm. And you have to read it at different stages of your life. I've been reading a half dozen uh, texts that, that are important to me. I've read them at various stages of my life. They change, but they always maintain their own integrity and their own sense of themselves. Mm. John, you once, you once said to me, I'm not very good at narrative, you know. And it seems to me, he says pompously, but looking at the broad sweep of your career, you've kind of moved almost from a kind of prosaic, beautifully prosaic reality to something more aspiring to the poetic. Is that fair? Well, yes. I mean, I, I, I learned, you know, as I practiced, and I'm still practicing how to write. Uh, as I got a little bit of skill with it, I learned how to do the things I really wanted to do. Um, that's true of all artists, I think. Um, but I get, I mean, it's all, the, the closer I get to being able to write, being able to do narrative, the further away from it I get. Uh, that's why I write these crime books, because mm. I can have fun there. You know, do plot and dialogue and human interest, all that stuff, mm. which uh, in the other books I have no interest in whatsoever. I mean, I don't care how people talk or how they look at each other, how they fall in love or the affairs they have or how they hate their parents. I have no interest in any of that. Mm. And any artist, if he or she <laughs> was honest, would say, yeah, yeah, we have no interest. Mm. It's a very strange phenomenon. Yeah. Not to be interested in life and yet using life as a material. Mm. You know. And you're not interested in life? No, not really, no. But yet you're astonished by it. No, I'm astonished by the world. No, no, I, I, I just regard us as... You see, this is, this is a good point. The Renaissance was a big swerve. Before the Renaissance, people lived in a, a sort of circular world. If you look at pre-Renaissance paintings, before the discovery of perspective, which was another great disaster for us, as a civilization, because that brought, that, that brought the male gaze straightforward. Before that, women ran the world, you know. Uh, men went down and fought and they dragged back the carcasses and they cut it up, but women were running things. But in the Renaissance, men took over. Mm. And perspective, discovery and perspective was part of that. Um, where were we? I've lost, I've lost track, I've lost perspective. Um, Narrative. Was I talking about narrative? I think you were. Yeah, sorry. Anyway. I My brain just, you know... Mine likewise. It's too full of stuff. John, you mentioned there, you know, the Benjamin Black novels. You know, and you've often said about the fun you have with those. And where did that, where did that emerge from? And, and, you know, was Benjamin Black a kind of almost some sort of marketing device to separate it off from John Banville. No, I mean, I, I've told the story many times in public before. I, I had a, a television script that wasn't going to be made, and I thought one day I'll turn it into a novel. Mm. And that was because I had begun, I started reading George Simenon, whom I'd never read before. This is about 2003. And I regarded Simenon as just a pop writer. In fact, Simenon was one of the great literary artists of the 20th century. Uh, it was a friend of mine, an English philosopher, John Gray, put me on to it. Um, and when I saw what could be done in a limited form, very small vocabulary, uh, um, very, you know, very short sentences, moving forward quickly, 
And I thought I'd try it. Mm. I mean, I could never achieve the economy that Simenon does. But that was where it started. Mm. And, um, and now, now that I've given up, you know, the singularity is my last book of its kind. A friend of mine said to me recently, oh, so you're going to gentrify the crime novel, are you? And I thought, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a good idea. So I'll, 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 I'll sneak more and more long sentences into my crime books, and maybe nobody will notice, because they'll still be in the crime section, you know? <laughs> Clever. Which they shouldn't be, no book. I mean, bookshops should be just alphabetical, it should mm. be. Mm. You know, and especially this, you know, this new thing that they have now, literary fiction. They may as well have a sign on a cross, skull and crossbones saying, stay away. You don't, want, you don't want this stuff, you know. And we'll come back to the singularities in a minute, but, you know, you've, you've put Benjamin Black to bed and uh, you're now writing those novels under John Banville, whoever he is, and... You know, some people have observed, in fact, I read April in Spain very recently, and that the two genres or whatever, the Benjamin Black and the John Banville, are becoming closer together. They're becoming more unified. Is that yeah, fair? Yeah, the process of gentrification. Um, yeah, no, you're right. Uh, I think they are. But, you know, the Book of Evidence was a crime novel. Um, uh, the Untouchable, which is his spy novel. Mm -hmm. So I've always, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not with Beckett and, and, and Joyce and the modernists in despising the audience, purporting to despise the audience, but hoping to sell a whole bunch of books. Um, I, 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 I would like people to read the books, but I'm not going to compromise in order to induce them to read it. Mm. I want, I, I, one should never speak down to an audience, to a readership. You should bring them up. Because people don't care. You know, if you give people rubbish, they'll read rubbish, of course. I read rubbish myself. Mm. Um, but if you offer them other stuff as well, they'll rise to it. Mm. People are capable of... You know, I, I always tell the story. My, my, my late wife was in, um, in Marks and Spencer's one day, and... It was when the C had been published. It was a C. And the one the cash desk saw her credit card and said, "Are you related to to him?" And she, she said, "Tell him I just read the C. And it's the most beautiful thing I read." And tell him it was a cash woman at the Marks and Spencer that told that. That's worth ten Nobel prizes, you know. That's that's here's the people one writes for, not. The book reviewers and the critics or the prize juries one writes for it, the woman at the cash register in Marks and Spencer. And every now and then one of them comes forward and said, Yeah, I saw I saw what you were doing there. That's that's just marvellous. Mm. And yet, you know, often and, and this certainly isn't my experience, but often when I hear people talking about John Banville, you know, about the work or the man. There's often this perception of kind of high intellect, high art, austere, yeah. formidable, yeah. a little terrifying. How do you? Why not? As I said, I'm not going to speak down to people. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend to be other than I am. I do believe in the intellect. I do believe in high art. I do believe in high culture. I do believe this is one of the glories of European civilization, this tiny little part of the world, and look what we made. I'm not going to. Uh, step down from that. People will come up. And if they don't want to come up, let them go and read other stuff or listen to other music or look at other pictures. Um, you have to hold the line. Uh, and if I'm going to have a reputation of being arrogant or... I don't care. I don't care what people think about me. This is a strange thing. <laughs> you see, I don't read reviews and I don't read anything about myself. Mm. I have no idea what the world is saying about me. I've no, t t t t I was about to say Twitter, Twitter account. I've no Twitter account. Uh, it's better actually, I must remember that. Um, I've, I've, I've none of those things. But there's, a, there's a fake one in my, my name, which is very funny. Fake Twitter account. But no, I've no interest. 
But you must have some no. desire for no. appreciation, no? No. I want, as I say, I like to think that the woman in Marks and Spencer's or the adolescent sitting in his or her bedroom worrying about the world and life would pick up one of my books and, and see the, the beauty and the poetry that I've aimed for. That's, that's all. I, you know, <laughs> Borges said a wonderful thing. He said, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, you know, he said, uh, he said, when I started writing, I had about seven readers because my friends were very, you know, they, they, they were kind to me. They would read my stuff. And then I started publishing in small magazines and I had 70 readers. And I published a book and I had 700 readers. He said, now I have 700,000 readers. Who are these people? Who are these people? Mm. And I know what he meant. You know, I think that I probably have about 2,000 readers. And even if I sell a million books, I would still have those 2,000 readers. And, you know, a good reader is almost as rare as a good writer. To be able to, to, to take from a book at least some of what was put into it is a, is a rare gift. Mm. You mentioned The Singularity. It's your most recent book, uh, which, you know, as you've said to me before, is challenging and is in lots of ways a quite complex dream of all your books coming together in some strange tapestry. You, you know, the book is full of endings, full stops, and you've said that it's your last book of that kind. Is, is that really true? Do you really believe that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that took nearly six years to write. I'm 77. If I started another book like that, I'd be gaga by the time I got halfway through it. Um, no, I've done my work. I've done my work. It's, it's, I've, I've said, I said, God, one doesn't say. I've written what I had to write. Um, I'd write other books. Uh, uh, I've, I have a plan, actually, to write a book called The Last Man. And The Last Man is, you know, the world has been destroyed. The, one of the big super viruses, everybody's gone except for this last man. And he's quite happy because he's always wanted solitude. And, you know, <laughs> the, the animals have eaten all the bodies and it's the, the earth has cleared. And, and then he discovers there's a last woman. <laughs> and they set out to kill each other because they want to start the whole bloody thing over again. <laughs> so the book will be there devising ways to kill each other. And I told a friend of mine about this, and she said, that's absolutely horrible. That's horrible. They should just go and drown, drown themselves. I said, perfect. <laughs> they will hold hands and jump into the sea where we came from, and the last two people will go back to the sea. So I may write that. But now that I've told you, you what's see. the point of writing it? <laughs> well, there's a glint of the little gods working there, I think. Yeah. You know, you know, you've mentioned your age, you've mentioned this sense of kind of I've written what I needed to write. Does death scare you? Well, I, I mean, this, I, I, this beautiful world, I hate to leave it, but when I'm dead, I won't know that I'm dead. It won't be me being dead. There'll be nothing. Uh, as Woody Allen said, you know, I don't mind dying, but I don't prefer not to be there when it happens. <laughs> um, but otherwise, uh, no. But I would, like, I would like to start again. I would like another life. Um, I'm sorry for all the things I said about it. <laughs> I would like another life because it was, it was glorious. You know? My wife, on the night before she died, she said to me, I'm not afraid. I had a glorious life. And I hope that I would be able to say that myself in my last night, but I'd rather have it over again. I mean, it was such fun. Mm. And you know, it was, I mean, really, the life is such fun. It's awful in many ways. Uh, and we, my generation, we had the best of it. Mm. You know, I was born in 1945, between 1945 and 2008. It was glory. Of course, there were terrible things. There were wars. There were pestilences. There were, but 
we had the best of it. Mm. Uh, I worry very much about my children and my children's children now. But still, I'd like to see, I'd like to be around to see the next big scientific revolution because it's coming. You know, I always say this, you, you know about quantum entanglement? Quantum entanglement is really extraordinary. You have two particles, right? A red particle and a blue particle. You take the blue particle and you bring it to the other side of the galaxy and you change it to red. This one will instantaneously turn blue. This is, I mean, this is not a theory. This happens. It's in your phones. It's in your laptops. Quantum, uh, uh, quantum entanglement is used in, in modern science. And it's certainly going to be used in quantum computers. I would love to see some... You know, it, it won't happen in my time because they're too complicated. But I would love to know what's coming next. Because somebody, you know, at the end of the 19th century, uh, physics professors were telling their, people, their students, go and do something else because everything is known in physics. Mm. In 1905, Einstein said, uh, I'm not sure about that. And then the quantum physicists came along. This world is such a complex place. It's such, you know, I was talking last night, uh, friend, you know dogs, a dog has a sensor there, you know, at the top of its snout, that can catch one molecule of scent. Imagine a world in which a dog can catch one molecule of scent. This is the most extraordinary place. Mm. And I would love to know what science would be like in a hundred years' time, if we're here, mm. if we haven't done ourselves in. And... John, we were talking about our kind of mutual friend, Tom Murphy, the playwright outside. And Tom once said to me, I write so I can leave something behind. Is that, does that ring a bell for you? Yes, I suppose so. But, yeah. I, yes, I suppose so. I, I don't really know. I'm not evading the question, I just, I don't know what I think about um, the world when I'm gone. It'd be a much poorer place, of course. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but there's a wonderful uh, old French photographer called Eugène Ager. And Ager always took his photographs very early in the morning. There are no people in them. And Ager's photographs look to me like the world after I'm gone. Mm. It'll be very beautiful exquisitely beautiful and still you know when there won't be a lot of movement in it but I'll be gone you know, I'll be ashes no. no people in that landscape no no um, I mean I do have a vision of the world after we're gone when the the trees will sort of say oh god they're gone thank god now we can now we can grow now we can flourish and Mm, original nature will reassert itself. Because we are... Uh, there's a wonderful... Again, I wish I could, could uh, quote it verbatim. There's a wonderful aphorism of Nietzsche when he says, once there was a, in a corner of the universe, there was a, a world in which these creatures lived. And they lived for a moment, and then they went. And the universe went on. Mm. Um, but look... On the other hand, look what we've done. I mean, given what we are, given how greedy and grubby and awful we are, look the things we've done. You know, um, as, as, as you, see, you know, for every Hitler, there are two Beethovens. Uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing, mm. and we did it ourselves. We didn't do it with the help of the gods. Mm. We had to invent gods to find some way of explaining to ourselves how marvelous we are. Mm. Uh, and how terrible we are. I mean, the gods are vengeful as well. Greek gods are vengeful. Anyway. And John, if... if so you're we're, now, we're now going into the afterlife. This is one thing. <laughs> if there was one book of yours to be remembered, is, is there one you would... Is there one you... Oh, I always give the glib answer. The next one. You know, the one where I get it all right. But there's no next. The last man. 
last man. Somebody said to me, you'll have to do last man plus GB team plus, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I you know, think they've, they've retreated into the mists of prehistory for me. I don't remember them. Uh, for me, they're gone. Uh, I suppose, since the Singularities was the one that I ended on, I would like that to be remembered. Um, but, you know, I mean, it may be the ten minutes after I'm dead, I'll be, I'll be gone. Henry James was dead for 40 years after he died. It took an essayist in, in, during the war to bring him back. Mozart was gone until Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn brought him back. Uh, reputation is a strange thing. Uh, but I would like to think that somewhere in some corner of the world, somebody will be reading it, you know. Somebody huddled in a, in a hole in the ground, you know, for the nuclear waste, and he's reading one of my books, or she, or it. And often that, that figure, huddled reading a book, often reminds me of you. You know, you've had a, a life writing books, reviewing books, editing books, and often... I've seen you in restaurants alone with a book. Is, is that life in books, has that been rewarding for you? Well, of course. I mean, the book is one of the, the greatest things that we invented. I mean, the physical book. It's most, one of those beautiful things. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing like holding a book in your hand. Um, there's a thing on the, on the, the, the internet somewhere somebody showed it to me years ago. Oh, there's a monk sitting in his cell and he has in front of him a book. And, he's, you know, a printed book. Never seen one before, so he has to call technical help. So the technical help monk comes in and says, yeah, I tell you, okay, look, you open it here, you know. <laughs> it opens and he says, yeah, and it's got all this information in it. You know? He says, this is amazing. It's like us looking at a laptop. And the, the wonderful bit at the end is he closes the book and the technical help monk says, you clear about that? Oh, yeah, clear about it. Goes in, and the, the monk is trying to open it at the spine. Wait, wait, come back, I can't open it, I can't open it. Um, but the book is, look, laptops, they're, they're beautiful objects. iPhones are beautiful objects. You know, they're, they're wonderful things. But the book is still, you know, the smell of the book. I remember I, I had a, when I was book editor in the Irish Times, uh, I hired a new uh, reviewer of children's books, and she said, you know, the important thing about books for children is that they're physical objects. They love them, the smell of them, the look of them, and the taste of them. And of course, you, yeah, children do so chew on books. And that, I've spent my life chewing on books. Yeah. And I don't think that that's, I think that, that I've had a full life. I've, I've lived in many places, many worlds, inside many minds. It's a great gift to be able to read. Mm. Uh, you know, 26 letters in the alphabet. Look what's been made, 26 little marks on a page. Look what we've done. It's absolutely extraordinary. And you never felt you should get out of the house a bit more, no? <laughs> I get out of the house frequently. You see me in <laughs> wine bars reading. That's true. That's <laughs> out of the house. Right. Well, no, it's a good question. It's a good question. It's a good question. Um, we're probably finishing on it. Um, no, it's no. a good question. Uh, I think, I, I go back to the very beginning. Art informs life. We live more fully by being in touch with art. Art is not some diversion from life. It's not a... a you don't step in out of the rain to look at a few pictures in a gallery. If you look and really look at a few pictures in a gallery, you will be, you will be more vividly alive. You realize what it is to be a human being on this strange planet. That's what art does. Now, maybe there are other things. I mean, for people who love sport, then maybe they're vividly alive when they're watching sport. But for me, art is, is that... Uh, that eternal thing that's always there and that is a verification of being alive. This strange process of... And, of course, you know, one of the things about works about they're always better than we are. 
you know, we're grubby little people, you know, going around picking our noses and, you know, being awful to our children and all. The work of art is always, it's there. Diderot, the great French philosophe, Diderot had a wonderful notion. He said, the way to live is that you build a statue of yourself inside yourself and you try to live up, live up to, the, to the level of that statue. Isn't that a wonderful notion? And you know? have you done that? Yes, yeah. But then I was lucky that I had something that I was, could devote my life to, mm. uh, to, to making works of art. Uh, it's a great privilege. I don't see myself as, I, I'm simply a medium. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I, I know, I was reading again Elman's great biography of James Joyce, and God, Joyce was such an awful creature. You know, he really had this notion of himself. I don't have any notion of myself. Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I just, as I say, I can I grab me a little, little, little man living in the world. I, you know, I started out 77 years ago. I'll be gone shortly, and that's, that's it. Mm. Um, but that's okay, the only thing. If the books stay, that's all that will remain of me. I won't have been important. Well, this little book. Except to myself and to my loved ones and my children and my enemies and, you know. Well, I think this little grubby man has left behind some extraordinary, wonderful books. John Banville, thank you very much. Thank you.